Welcome to the Law Society Younger Members Committee Career Information Session number four, when Ashling Wood speaks to Barry McLaughlin about the communication skills critical for solicitors. Everybody. My name is um, Ashling Woods and I am a solicitor in John Lear's office and a member of the Young Members Committee. And tonight I am interviewing Barry um, McLaughlin, who is a former practicing solicitor and a communications expert in the communications clinic. So the communications clinic um, offers courses in communication skills and um, media skills, remote communications, job interview and um, preparation and written communication. Barry in particular also works with individual solicitors and with firms to improve their communication skills and we're very thankful uh, for Barry giving his time up tonight to come and speak with us and um, to give us some tips on how to improve our skills so obviously the topic tonight is communication skills for solicitors um, and, and how we can improve and, and um, I would just like to say thank you so much Barry for coming on Thank you. Uh, so we'll, I suppose we'll just kick start, kick start the questions. Um, the first question I had there, Barry, was, um, so lawyers are renowned for arguing and for being good on their feet, um, but are we good communicators? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, thanks to everyone for joining in. And I know you've all had a very long week, I'm sure. Like anybody working in an office, you're trying to cram five days into four days and you've got tomorrow off. So. Um, thank you very much for, for taking the time at the end of a long day to, to join us. Um, I suppose Ashley's question is, are, are lawyers good communicators? Um, I think we're very good on the transmit button. I think we're very good at arguing our case. I think we're very good, for example, in our written communication. We all know that when we were training, we were told, write that letter as if it ends up being reviewed by a high court judge. So we tend to be very careful in our written communications. I think one of the things, though, that as solicitors we have to watch out for is that we tend to become experts in things and particularly around processes and one of the things that I'd like you all thinking about that every time you meet a client whether it's a new client or an existing client or a colleague or whatever you're either building or unbuilding a relationship so every time you encounter somebody they're going to think a little bit better of you or a little bit worse and hopefully we're, we're trying to get into a position where every encounter is that little bit better and I think one of the key things you must remember is that all the information you have, maybe when a client walks in the door, that's not all the information the client might need right now. And one of the things that I think is very important is to try and either by preparation or by listening and questioning, work out where your client is or the person you're dealing with before you start launching into a big, long legal process or explanation. So I suppose one of the things to remember is that and um, there is a difference between your expertise and just the amount of information that a client or somebody who isn't a lawyer may need to know. So I think one of the things I'd always encourage people to, to think about in any communication is to adopt two positions. Where is my audience before I start talking and where do I want my audience afterwards? And the more preparation you do and the more questioning and listening you do, the more likely you are to actually uh, be a good communicator. It's not always about how well you speak or how much you speak. It's about how much you focus on and engage early with the person you're trying to communicate. So I think we are good communicators, but we're very good at transmitting data. And sometimes it's actually about listening, taking a moment to see exactly where your client is before you launch into explaining a long process that the client may not remember or actually may not even care about at this stage. And that actually leads nicely into my next question, um, which was how important is it to know your audience or your clients? And I think that that's kind of, you know, touching on what you were saying there. Yeah, I, I think if you can look at it, that there's a, any of you who've ever worked in sales or have been involved in sales, there, there's a very simple technique for developing a sales process. And the, there's five questions. And the first question is you identify the need the second question is you clarify the need and the third question is confirm the need. Now, the last two points are about doing the business and getting the deal done. But what's actually really interesting in the first three questions are finding out about your client. So one of the things if you, you know, and we all get people who walk in the door, we've never met them before, but it's really important you take, first of all, that time 
to actually find out exactly where the client is coming from and try and ascertain, are, are they worried? Are they concerned? Um, my, my wife is also a solicitor pointed out to me that, you know, we're a little bit like dentists. Nobody really wants to come into us. You only go into a solicitor if you have to. And let's say someone goes, maybe they're buying a house. I mean, they're delighted and all like, but sometimes they're looking at the solicitor going, oh my God, is there a problem here or what's going wrong? So think about from the point of view, I, I remember getting a great bit of advice when I was in Blackhall many years ago from, from one of the, the uh, solicitors come into uh, lecturers and he made the point that the half hour you spend in the office with the client might just be a mark on the calendar for you but for the client that is probably the most important half hour of their week so it pays to just listen to pay attention and you know just you know and, and I think as well and I, I was talking to Ashley about this yesterday I, I'm not a recently qualified solicitor as you might have noticed but I remember the first couple of months when I qualified, I had all these great legal terms in my head and I was very keen to use them. And I found myself one day quoting um, a, a piece of the legislation on the Road Traffic Act to a, a relative of mine who had no light on their tractor. And I remember they looked at me and went, um, that's, not, that's not really helpful. I just need to know what the situation is. So sometimes all this wonderful information we have and this knowledge, we want to share it and we want to speak in the language of the, the lawyer. But actually, it's about your client comes in, you spend a few minutes going, OK, what's on this person's mind? What are they worried about? And before I even offer to jump in and reassure them or tell them where they're going, um, I just need to work out exactly where, where they are. And the thing as well is that a lot of clients, um, you know, they, they arrive into you maybe with a summons, maybe with a letter from another solicitor about something that they weren't expecting the, that morning when they opened the post. And it's about you actually guiding them and reassuring them by actually listening and actually paying a lot of attention to what they're saying. I remember when, when I was in Black Hall, and maybe they still do this, the, the client um, counselling competitions, and they were brilliant. They were really good because, um, you know, you, you actually, you're given a whole bunch of legal information and the client gives you information. And I remember taking part in that competition. I remember spectacularly missing three or four things the client was really concerned about and that takes practice and if you're dealing with a client that you know really well and if you're really really busy can I make a little suggestion to all of you take 90 seconds between your files take a deep breath and go right I'm now meeting Ashling once right let me just remind myself again Ashling was in read the memo what was wrong with her what was up what's her situation okay so you're just taking a breath and you're going right I'm now meeting the individual I'm not meeting the file. I'm not just treating that as another file that I have to process. And that 90 seconds can give you an awful lot of insight and kind of set you up to be not just a, a better solicitor, but more engaging with your clients as well, because they remember how they feel going into the office, not necessarily the result at the end. It's how you deal with them as well. Yeah, it's a really good point. You're kind of trying to build rapport. And I suppose when our solicitors were, were so conscientious of trying to um, show like the work that we've done for the day or we're billing by the hour or, you know, you work in a really high volume. Sometimes it's really difficult to like, you know, take that take that break and just to kind of calm from your last meeting. So it's a really good point. You're building rapport. Um, the next query that, that I just had there in relation to communication was, you know, what tips or advice would you give to solicitors who are dealing with, you know, clients who might have literacy problems or, or uh, significant learning difficulties now, obviously leaving aside capacity because yeah. we all yeah. know about that. Absolutely. And, and uh, we spend uh, most of our lives worried about worried about that. But in terms of the, the, the your job as a communicator is that you have to create understanding, not necessarily agreement. So one of the things that is very good in terms of engaging with people is if you become an active listener. So if you're dealing with somebody who maybe uh, literacy is an issue and you're, you're, you know, the only way you can deal with them is by talking with them or maybe there's an interpreter. A very good technique to kind of show people that you're listening with them is what we call active listening. Now, none of us do it. I mean, it's a very hard thing to do and it's something we can all work on. But an example of active listening is the client says something you ask a question before you come and say, can you tell me more about that? So you actually ask that open question, explain that to me a little bit more. You seek clarification, but then you repeat back what the client has said back to them. Now it does take a bit of time, 
but there is nothing more satisfactory for somebody to hear somebody say back exactly what they've heard and going, I understand what you're saying. I mightn't agree with it, but if you can let someone know, I understand what you're saying, the situation you're in, the law or the facts might take us in a different direction. But building that rapport with somebody early on to say, look, I absolutely understand. And I don't just mean the, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, gotcha, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. That actual really verbalizing back what the client has, say, has said. Let them know that you've listened, let them know you've engaged. And then they know that you're on their side because a lot of people you're dealing with maybe who maybe language may be an issue or literacy may be an issue mm -hmm. are the very people who possibly would see our profession as part of the problem. And you have to work really hard to bring these people in with you as well. Mm -hmm. That's a, so, but even in, even in our own kind of personal lives, the ability to say to our other half, I've heard what you've said and repeat it back. Um, you know, it's something we can absolutely all work on. Oh, most certainly, most certainly. Um, and I suppose, you know, when you're building that kind of rapport, how important are names? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of, now, as you see, if you're looking at the screen here, I've been just rechristened Ashling Woods. Now, clearly, I'm, <laughs> I'm not Ashling Woods. And no. <laughs> in, many, in many respects, you know, Zoom has made things a little bit easier because we, we have people's names. What I'm talking about is when you're in, you know, in court, maybe taking instructions in, a, in when we're all back to normal or you're meeting clients or whatever. And using and getting people's names is a very good skill to build a network, to sort of engage with people. And it's also very useful when you're trying to control a meeting. So a, a really good technique is if you can think of the letters F, A, C and E, think of face. And there's a little mnemonic to remember how to get someone's name. So the F stands for focus. So a little bit like I said at the beginning, you want to, you know, focus on your client or you're meeting someone for the first time. So if I'm meeting Ashing for the first time, I would focus on, I put down my file, put down my cup of coffee, my phone, and I'm going to give this person my attention to get their name. So F is focus. A is acknowledge the name, say it back. Hello, Ashling, how are you? The C is confirm the name, you know, and, and maybe not in Ashling's case, but it could be as well. How do you spell the name? Maybe you're writing it down for a file or we're dealing with a lot of people who would have very, you know, different nationalities, different cultures, even Irish names were, were coming up to, to we're in Shockton the Gaelic at the moment. So there's a lot of Irish names. I'll be honest with you. I've never heard before. I think they're great, but it's very important you get the name right. So the C is you confirm the name. You, you make sure, so I spell that right, it's A-I-S-L-I-N-G or whatever the name is. So you say the name or spell it to get it right. And the E is employ, and that's the easiest way. If you start using people's names, you're much more likely to remember them. Names are important because it's a, a very good way to engage with people, obviously on a personal level. But if you're in a difficult discussion or a meeting and you're trying to gently interrupt someone or get someone's attention, saying their name out loud is almost gives you a little elbow in and Ashley mentioned we do media training. And one of the things that, for example, people are appearing on a panel show, like say Brendan O'Connor or something like that, we would encourage them to use the name of the presenter or the person they're trying to interrupt or get in politely, because that's the best way to get someone's attention. Say their name and then you can continue. So getting and using and getting in that habit of remembering names, because it is a habit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you can't walk around forever saying, oh gosh, how are you? Great to see you again. How are things? Because people just know you don't remember their name. So if you can try and, and get into that habit, it's a really good one to do. And again, it helps build that rapport and it, it makes things a little bit more friendly as well. You know, it's not so formal. So people might not be, you know, a, a, as afraid going in. Like, as you said, some people, you know, will be kind of traumatized going into the solicitor's office. It's not something they're That's used true. to. And, you know, they have a significant problem. So and just as well, I mean, I, I went to college in, in Limerick and I don't know if there's any University of Limerick uh, graduates on the call. Limerick's a great town. It's, 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 you know, it's a very friendly place. You can kind of walk around Limerick going, all right, kid, how are you, boss? How are things? Doesn't work in Dublin. So, you know, getting people's names and remembering people. <laughs> is important. It's a, really, yeah. it's a really good point as well. And you mentioned, um, Barry, that you deal with the media. So what would the do's and don'ts be? Uh, for solicitors who speak in public, so people who are who are dealing with the media, what tips yeah. would you have for, for those kind of solicitors? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, I mean, there's always going to be a natural reticence among a lot of people in the legal profession to go on media. You, you know, they know that, the you know, for example, 
the, the, the damage that, um, you know, a comment might cause an investigation. And I think what where I see, I think a lot of our colleagues would go on is maybe at the end of a case where maybe they're speaking on behalf of a client or, you know, after an inquest or, or something as well. I think this, for a couple of simple rules apply. Again, think about your audience. And if you're doing media, you're quite entitled to ask a number of questions first. Like if you're doing an interview, what's my topic? What, when am I on? Who's on before me and who's on after me? Really important points because you don't want to do an interview where maybe, you know, you're there talking about the, the, the value of free legal aid. And then the next next guest is uh, some local, some poor unfortunate who's been robbed and, you know, the sympathy is immediately going to go with, with, with them. So it's really important that you, you and you're quite entitled to ask these questions because just as much as the media are free to have anyone on, you're also free to say, you know, I don't need to go on it or I'm not going to go on it. So I think the point I'd make is if you're going on media, what is the key thing you want people to remember at the end? Is it a point about your client? Is it a point about the law? Maybe there's a gap in the law or something needs to happen. And you try and make maybe that high idea, make it understandable by way of an example. So if there is a consequence to this, if there's something that would be better if the law was changed or the law was different or the government did something differently. And a great way to do that is with stories. So I'm sure all of you have kind of had to adapt recently to how the courts are running at the moment. And I think the court service and fairness them are doing a really good job in terms of trying to keep the show on the road. But we hear stories about cases that have been delayed or cases that have to be adjourned or people who just because of their circumstances, it's that bit more difficult. So a story can be much more effective than simply stating that um, a whole, you know, there, there, there's a problem with the legal list is causing significant delays. That's a story, that's a, that's a statement. I have a client who's an old woman who had to get the train up from Dublin today and her case didn't get on. That's a story people remember. So it's about just about thinking about it from the point of view of storytelling. And that's what media love, media love a story. And if you do find yourself with explaining a legal concept, give an example, because mm -hmm. concepts mean nothing to ordinary people without a specific example. Yeah, you're kind of creating a picture, but then you're creating yeah. a different level of understanding. It to yeah, it totally makes sense. And there's one other thing as well, I just say, Ashing as well, on that point, audiences don't care about the process. Mm -hmm. So think about, you know, we, we all work through a process. There's a legal process, there's a civil process or whatever. They want to care about the outcome. So if you're starting your media interview, what you need to do is rather than start that and explain how this all came about or what the issue is, you need to say, make it very simple for the audience. And there's two ways you can do that. You either identify a problem and point out a solution or you offer a benefit. So what I'm here to talk about today will make the running of family law cases much easier. Let me tell you what it is. Now we've got your audience hooked. Rather than saying, well, as you know, the, the, the last time the Family Law Act was, was, was uh, amended was in whenever. And because of that, and, and that's the legal process that nobody cares about. We want to know is, why does it matter to me? And unfortunately, because of things like Zoom and because of everything else, our attention spans are getting shorter. So really, you need to be getting that answer in the media interview, which is generally, what's this all about? You have about 30 seconds to get your audience's attention. And that's where you need to practice. Why should they care? Yeah, they're really good points. Um, just then in terms of um, younger solicitors communicating with kind of more experienced senior solicitors, what kind of tips would you have um, for those solicitors? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in that awkward position now, Ashing, where, you know, 10 years ago, I was that younger solicitor, and now I'm probably... We well, still are, we still are, we're fine, I, we're fine. I, we're fine. That, 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 that <laughs> middle crank. I think it's knowing your audience. I mean, even simple things, for example, you know, um, the best communication, by the way, is what, what communication you can do that's either face-to-face -face or verbal. So think about an email you send to somebody. You've no idea when they're going to read it, but you've also no idea what mood they're going to be in. So sometimes the letters we send or the emails we send might seem perfectly fine on a Friday evening when we're rushing out the door. Someone reads it on a Friday night or a Monday morning and they're going, well, what the hell does he mean by that? So anywhere you can engage with people on a kind of a personal level. So my advice would be, um, I first of all, just 
professional politeness, I'd probably ring ring somebody's office or drop an email and say, look, is there a time that suits you for a quick chat on the file? Work out what you're going to say, have your all your things lined up and ready, ready to go. And where email is very useful is, and I would always encourage any solicitor to do it, you keep your own record. So you are the person recording what you understood from that meeting or from that memo, and you keep that on your file and you send that back as well. So I think it's just a case of the, a little, polite as a professionalism, because I, I think even, even an, not so much an age thing, but responsibility and how busy people are, obviously senior people, partners are exceptionally busy. So they see their time as quite valuable. So just trying to get a little bit of time that you can actually have a conversation with them is always better initially to build the rapport, but make sure you're well prepared. You've worked out what it is you want to say, what are the issues you want to discuss. Um, obviously there's, there's, there's client confidentiality and all that. Um, and I think that um, it's about just making sure that you are um, well prepared going in that, you know, and I've done it myself when I was practicing, you're so busy, you're going, oh, I've got to ring whoever, I grab the file, and I'm flicking through it and trying to work out what I'm going to call. And they can pick it up and you know as well, and you're, you're not having a satisfactory interaction. So I would always say, just take that even that two minutes ago, right? Okay, what's on this file? What do I need to know? What are the things I need to sort out? And if you're a little bit awed or overawed by the person you're going to call, practice out loud what you're going to say. So imagine, don't, don't, don't like we've all had that first day in the district court where we're da 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 and you do it three or four or five or six or seven times you're fine so i think it's really important you practice out like just take even if like i i found myself not long qualified speaking with a very eminent solicitor i won't give the the, the individual's name but i mean i i just you know i i kind of i was oh my god oh my god oh my god like, very professional absolute gentleman but I would have benefited so much more from practicing out loud what I was going to say a couple of times. And you know what? It doesn't matter. You put the time in and you get one good call and you build a bit of a rapport or you have a better professional relationship. It's time well spent. Yeah, it's a really good point. I think, though, um, sometimes it's back to what you said about kind of knowing your audience. So, like, obviously, if you need something, don't go in before they have their morning coffee. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That could be or, it, yeah. you know, um, as you said, preparation is key. So sometimes like when you're kind of dealing with more experienced um, senior solicitors and you're working underneath them, you might go in with one question, but then they fire 10 questions at you. And if you're not prepared and you haven't kind of, you know, um, reviewed nearly the entire file before you go in, sometimes you can be caught off guard and yeah. then it looks like you are wasting their time because you have to go off and look for what they've asked you then, you know, so it's a really good point. Um, so then just in relation to um, my next question is how important is communication in letters? So I know there isn't supposed to be a tone, but, but what are your, your tips on that? Yeah, and I think and I, I just see there's a, a question there as well from Frida about communication in general. If I could just make a, a, a point around communication, and it's something we're, I think we're going to get to actually near the end about what we call a trusted advisor. But one of the things that will make you an outstanding professional is if clients get a sense and your colleagues get a sense that you're a very good communicator. There's an old saying in, in, in networking that the work you do nine to five defines your salary. The work you do before and after those hours in terms of engaging with clients defines your career. So obviously written letters, and I'm not talking about our section 68s or our burn letters or whatever that, you know, they they have to do a particular thing. But if you look at, for example, the medical profession, over 30% of complaints made against doctors are not about ethical issues. They're not about clinical issues. They're about communication. Because at that time, when people are at their most vulnerable, they felt they weren't listened to, they were talked down to, or they didn't understand what was explained to them. So I would encourage anybody, if you're writing your letter, follow you know, the, the Warren Buffett rule. Warren Buffett, the, the, the famous um, investor and, and, and fund manager, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, one of the biggest funds managers in the world and owns stocks and businesses all over the world. He had a very simple rule, even though his business is a billion, billion dollar business. If my older sister and my younger sister don't understand the books, can't read the, the annual report, 
I have a problem as a communicator. So what are the things we can do about that? So for example, and I'm sure that the, the, I know when I was in, in Black Hole Place, we were moving everyone away from alt, inst, proximo, all those phrases we were using because everyone else was using them. So like even, you know, writing letters, you know, been, been, been sort of addressing people by maybe by their first name, if you've dealt with them before, making sure your letter gets to the point. That's a, that is a courtesy you owe everybody who reads your letters. Uh, now, sometimes, obviously, for the purpose of litigation and everything, letters have to be complex and they're layered and they're saying things and they're not saying things. And I'm not talking about that. But if you're updating your client, um, almost imagine you're reading the letter out to them. How would they react? So m m make a sense that, get, get a sense as well that the shorter the letter, the better. And this might mean learning to write your letters, put them away, have a look at them an hour later and go, yeah, well, I can edit this, I can edit this. One little point I'd make as well, it's something that Irish people are very fond of is the word which. We are devils for using the word which to join two sentences together or even three sentences together. So we have a little rule in, in writing when we're tra training our clients to write, do a witch hunt. Mm -hmm. If you find the word which, take it out and make it two shorter sentences. Um, but also as well, always give the client the option that they can ring you if they have any questions or whatever as well. But um, just make sure that if there are legal phrases, you explain them and actually ask yourself, do I really need to give them the legal phrase? Because what is it I need them to do next? So it's a little bit like all communication. Yeah. What, what are they doing now and what do I need them to do? So if you need them to come in and sign something, you probably don't need to explain to them the, the, the merits of, a, of a, a binding contract. You just need to say, look, if this is in, we need to do this if we're going to do the following. So just keep it simple. Keep it keep it practical. Yeah, to the point. To the point. Um, sorry to interrupt, Barry. Um, I might just read Frida's question and we'll, we'll end on this point because I know we're, we're at the 30 minute mark now. Um, and Frida had just said, um, do you think that there might be a change of mindset with some members of, of the profession in relation to their duty to communicate properly with clients? Well, I hope so in terms of I hope that the change of mind is to communicate better and have yeah. a better plan and be be more conversational. I mean, I think a very good guide and a mark is if you look at the, the plain English standard, I think a lot of firms are, are, are looking for that and at that at the moment. And um, at the end of the day, if you're not communicating clearly or understandably with people and what I mean by communication is actually asking people, do they understand? And it's probably no harm at some stage if you're engaging with a significant client. Part of your review to say, well, do you do we do we update you enough? Do we update you too much? Do you want the emails? Would you rather we did a webinar? And all these things you can actually get a sense of what your clients want. So, well, actually, do you know what? I don't like that email on a Friday. I'd much rather get a phone call. So it's just a constant process of checking in with what is the best and most effective way to get in with that client as well. I, I think, though, at the moment, because of technology, we've certainly improved our ability to communicate with clients. Like I know in, in like, for instance, I have a mobile and my clients would WhatsApp me, you know, no, it's depending on, on the clients, obviously. Um, but obviously that wasn't available before. So they have email, they have WhatsApp, they have a mobile number, they have my office number. You know, um, communication is, is, is flowing. Um, so I think that technology has certainly helped, you know. Um, I don't think there's any other questions there. Um, I think I'll have to wrap it up, Barry, just because of the time. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on. It was so interesting. Um, and if anybody wants to contact Barry, he's in the communications clinic. And again, he deals with solicitors and, and firms directly as well. Uh, thank you so much for everybody logging on. Uh, and it was very nice to talk to you, Barry.